Good afternoon and welcome to today's Industry Week webcast, Data-Driven Manufacturing, Leveraging Your Assets to Your Benefit, sponsored by Epicor. My name is Jill Jesko and I'm Executive Editor of Industry Week. Before we begin, I'd like to explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or your slides aren't advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you're running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable that to view the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the question mark help up button in the upper right corner to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the maximize icon in the upper right corner to enlarge the window. And we welcome your questions during today's event. To submit your questions, simply type your question into the ask a question window on the left side of your screen and then hit the submit button. We will be addressing as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that follows the main presentation. But please feel free, and in fact, we encourage you to send in your questions at any time as they occur to you, and we will add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded, and it will be available on the Industry Week website within the next day for you to review. You will be notified by email when that archive is available. When the webinar ends, we ask you to please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen. Now I'd like to take a moment to welcome today's speaker. Joining us today is Alan Salton, the Director of Innovation for Panorama Consulting Group. As an experienced professional with a 35-year history of working in the computer software industry, Alan leads the innovation of business models business processes, and technology strategy at Panorama. He is leading the implementation of an open innovation strategy to develop networks and partnerships with startups, industry analysts, academics, technology influencers, and venture capital partners. For further information about Alan, please check out the speaker details tab on your console. And with that, welcome Alan, and the floor is yours. Um, <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks, Jill. Thank you, everybody, for joining our session today. I hope everybody's having a good day. Um, we are going to talk a little today about how to move to a new um, decision paradigm based on uh, data and analytics. And the information we're going to present, much of it is going to be based on a couple of user cases, some companies that we have uh, worked with uh, over the last couple of years who've kind of gone through this transition. So, you know, we want to start just very briefly by saying, okay, really what is data-driven manufacturing? Um, and the way we like to look at it is uh, leveraging connectivity and data to transform manufacturing planning, manufacturing execution, uh, which reshapes the value chain. Um, and then using the, the KPIs and the analytics that you can, uh, that you can find through the connectivity um, to optimize your decision-making process. So we kind of look at it broadly, um, and it can be applied to any kind of company, um, and it can be applied to pretty much any processes or cross-processes. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the goals uh, for data-driven manufacturing. And these are the goals that were set from the two clients uh, that we, we worked with. Um, and I think pretty much you'll understand that really what they're trying to do is, is derive actual insights. You know, it's good to have data. It's good to have information. And they have information. And most clients have a large, a large amount of data, historical data, um, that really they haven't figured out how to leverage into, into information. So they want to see what, how they could use the data they have and collect more data to make better actionable insights. Using that to be more proactive, to predict future outcomes, um, to, uh, to kind of foresee um, what the, uh, what the uh, outcomes are going to be, uh, use advanced analytics. Um, and a lot of this also talks about, and we'll mention this later, is the move from re uh, descriptive reporting to predictive or prescriptive. So descript uh, descriptive reporting is really retrospective. It's kind of looking back over the last year or the last two years or some period of time 
um, and using the information you have to tell you what happened. A cash flow report will tell you, you know, retrospectively what cash flow looked like. When we start talking about predictive analytics, it's more like using the data that you have, customer behavior, uh, transactional behavior, um, and start looking at things like liquidity planning, which is looking forward to understanding what cash flow is going to look like, and then acting upon, uh, getting recommendations to be able to act upon how you can change processes, how you can change transactions, how you can change terms of payment and early uh, payment discounts to actually influence, for instance, cash. When this could apply to manufacturing, predictive maintenance, um, uh, selling, uh, buying anything. Um, and eventually, uh, what we get to, at least the, the stretch goal that was set, is eventually to have kind of a self-optimizing system across the supply chain using data, using analytics, um, so they can eventually be more productive, more efficient, more profitable. So the first client we're going to talk about um, is a, a Midwest-based manufacturer of chemical products. Um, they have six plants, um, and and the revenue is just under a billion dollars. Now, the, this company has grown uh, through both organic growth um, and acquisition, um, and uh, because of that, they have lots of different systems. Some of the, the companies they acquired had their own uh, ERP system or their own warehouse management system, um, and they had siloed data. So it was very difficult from a corporate perspective to make uh, any kind of judgment about you know, efficiency, productivity, um, profitability, um, because everybody kind of had their own information silo. Um, and another thing they found is that pretty much all of their planning it was reactive, you know, uh, chasing after late orders. I don't know when you go through and meet with the clients and, and you say, well, you know, what are your primary issues? They're like, every order is seems like it's running late. So they're always uh, chasing issues because there wasn't a good uh, end to end uh, visibility into data. Um, and what they, um, you know, they had some older technology, they had some very new technology, they had a big variety of systems with different capabilities, but they really understood. Um, is that because they had relatively low margins, it was a uh, cost reduction um, that was most important. Um, now, one thing I will say about this client is when we first met them, they had kind of already put together an enterprise transformation team. So they recognized they had some issues. They recognized that they wanted to, to run the company different. So they'd already put a team together to at least conceptualize what it is they wanted to do. Um, and then when we met with them, we talked about what their pain points. Well, one is lack of visibility um, into the margins on the product because they had different systems. They used different costing methods. Um, they had no reporting standards, unified reporting standards. Um, and, you know, all the different systems, for some reason, even if they were making the same product, which is not uh, unusual, would end up having different kind of costings, depending on, on the setup of the system and the overheads and the, and the way that was all done. They were also not happy with their on-time delivery. While they were, you know, up in the in the ninety percent, you know, in a very competitive, low-margin environment, that's that's not um, uh, adequate. So they really wanted to push on-time delivery. Um, part of that was this next one. You know, we would talk to them, and they would say, "Hey, they had every Monday they had an expediting meeting, and the expediting meeting was really just firefighting. How we get this product out? How are we going to prioritize?" one client over another client and every salesperson or every sales manager was putting their client first. Um, and it, that wasn't really a data driven way of setting priorities and they had no real data driven way of actually doing production planning. And because we had six plants with six different systems and six different managers, they kind of created information fiefdoms and everybody was very protective of their information. They didn't want to share information for whatever reason, whether it was because uh, they were they were trying to retain margin for their particular uh, PL or, or whatever it happened to be. That each of these information uh, fiefdoms, the managers were very protective, and as as a whole, corporate really had no good clear idea. They had no clear uh, standards to be able to judge performance, productivity, and profitability. Um, and because so much of of what they did, and so much what their daily operations was was firefighting. Um, plant, retaining plant personnel, I think, was really hard because people were stressed out. Um, they were working a lot of overtime, uh, and they kind of enabled a culture of blame, you know, because everything seems to be always chasing the last order. There was always somebody responsibility. And in fact, the, the truth is, 
uh, it was lack of adequate planning and scheduling and understanding an end to end value change that led them to the thing. And, and labor nowadays, I think everybody can understand, is, is a big issue. So it's hard enough to attract the talent. It's equally important to be able to retain them uh, by creating a, a positive work environment. Our second client was a little different. It's an East Coast uh, manufacturer. They're making bioscience products. Um, they have a single plant, um, and they have an independent uh, finance and logistics production company. And the reason is uh, because they started out pretty much as an R&D uh, entity. Then they were doing research or developing products. They were more um, only focused initially on the financial perspective and about costs and people and uh, and timesheets. Um, and I think there was an initial idea that well maybe when we get to production we'll just outsource it. We'll find a contract manufacturer. Um, and so th so the whole idea of production and logistics was kind of secondary to what they wanted to do. Um, and given the, the, pro the market they're in and products they were developing, this idea of quality um, and manufacturing uptime um, was really important. Even though it's a bio biosciences product, it was a low dollar, you know, a little higher revenue, but, you know, it really was about being able to, um, to get uh, orders out, um, to have good quality inspections on their products. Um, and, and that, of course, meant that, you know, lot tracing, lot tracking, um, which we do in Excel, became very critical to be able to have a uh, lot trace, batch and trace and track. Um, and that took a lot of time. And part of what the issues were is, is that the quality management function took a very long time. So their pain points, well, you know, they had a huge concern that the items were going to be shipped before they completed quality inspections. And what they were doing is they were waiting to the end of the product and inspecting at, uh, at the final product uh, stage. So they were very concerned um, that product may be shipped without quality inspection and the liability uh, that ran from that. They had another is issue because having a separate finance system and a logistics uh, system, when they got together and looked at the numbers, the numbers didn't match. They would run a sales report out of the logistics system, you know, with quantity and product and price and just kind of get one number. And then they'd, at, they'd look at the GL and they looked at um, posted invoices and the numbers just didn't tie because they were different systems. Um, they had that, again, a, a constant expediting orders. You know, the, again, it's amazing how many people get together, how many companies, and they have an expediting meeting because they haven't fixed the process and they don't have good visibility into where the bottlenecks are. Um, and we talked about tra uh, track and trace. You know, when, you, when you're looking at lot, large volumes of material coming in that are lot managed and you have been, uh, you also have, then have to look at the uh, issue of lots into production and through production to finish, to shipment and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you're doing it in something like Excel, um, that that's, always an issue and takes a lot of time. And because of that, they were short shipping a lot because the stuff couldn't get through final inspection uh, in time to be able to make the expected delivery date. So what we did, you know, they, we were contacted to help them kind of uh, address the pain points, not really say, hey, come in, we are interested in, in data-driven manufacturing, but it was come in, help us address our business issues um, and so we came in with the approach of, well, the first thing you have to understand is what's the information strategy? What information do you need to be able to address things like efficiency, productivity, productivity profitability? How do we address that the fact, uh, how do we address the fact that you're always um, behind, um, that your capacity isn't being utilized? So the whole idea of the information strategy, what information do you need to make good decisions? Then look at the process part of it to make sure they're deploying best practices. Because as good as, you know, if you, you put in a data-driven system and you collect data, but your process, and, and that's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Sometimes you need to have good KPIs. You have to have good information to, to measure and improve a process. But in certain things, you can go in right from the beginning and say, hey, let's address these issues. Let's em emphasize that process, process improvements. Let's talk about uh, how we want to, what concepts we have for analytics. What kind of reporting do you need? What kind of information are, are you going to have? Then we build that architecture. We go through the technology selection. So the technology piece, while, while we talk about data-driven and people think it's a technology issue and a technology solution, 
it's really more of a, a business issue with a technology enabler. So that kind of you see is more at the tail end of what we do. And then it's a matter of getting in and, and we help them through implementation oversight um, and optimization. So as we get more and more data, and we'll talk about how data is collected, to look at the reports, to look at the analytics, to figure out if there are better ways of, of gleaming um, insight from all that information. So what does that look like? Well, it's kind of a, a, a bottom-up and top-down uh, model that we work with. One is to understand the corporate um, objectives. You know, what is it? And we always start every engagement with a kind of a strategy overview. What's a three to five, 10-year uh, vision of where the company is going to be? Because that starts driving the kind of reports, the kind of analytics that you need. How much of it is from customer behavior information? How much of it is from vendor behavior information? How much of it is from internal um, uh, process uh, data. So we, we set the objectives, we kind of figure out what the enabling information is that they're going to need to have. Um, and then we establish the right KPIs and analytics to be able to make good decisions to, innate, to uh, enforce the, um, the corporate objectives. On the other hand, we, we also look at it from the bottom up. So we, we need to look at operations and, and we need to look at the uh, shop floor technology. We need to look at connectivity. We need to look at processes. That whole idea of operational technology, that's the OT you see over there is, you know, what kind of machines, how good is your connectivity, how good is your data collection? And then how do we take that into the IT system and marry that with the analytics to be able to get that kind of information? And it's a two-way flow so that the information goes up to the top, so to the to management level, the business level, so they make good, good, good decisions, and information flows down to the operational level so they know how to better manage um, uh, their day-to-day -day operations. It's that, that operational execution stuff is also based on really good information. So what is the, you know, what's an information strategy? That first part we talked about is really about having a vision for the, what, where the company is going to be. Uh, having a strategy for how you're going to uh, implement you know, information strategy, not a business strategy, information strategy for uh, enabling the corporate objectives, uh, making sure you have people who are going to own both the process and the information that comes out, make sure you have rules and formats and standards for information across the, the organization. And that's a very tough one to be able to set up standards. That whole idea of information governance is about sta standard formats, um, standard collection, um, having the right analytics, understanding the information lifecycle, and the enabling infrastructure, which a lot of people put that kind of as the most important thing. We need MES, we need sensors. You do. That's absolutely critical that you have from that bottom-up layer, you have the ability to collect, aggregate, structure, visualize data. But it, it's more having everything in place so you know what to collect and you know how to collect it and how to visualize it that it's enabling the decisions uh, that come further up the chain. And, you know, there, there is that idea of ERP, MRP. Uh, Epicor is a great system um, for, for doing a, that kind of business level, that stuff. And MES is kind of the, the uh, operations execution. And, again, you have the opportunity to have um, a best-of-breed solution or, in, you know, something like Epicor where there really is good detailed granular control down to software level um, for planning and execution. And down at the very machine level, the process control. You know, whether it's SCADA or PCS or pulse counters, you know, the, the very bottom kind of thing. Because you put all this stuff together. And again, what we mentioned before is the idea of taking that data um, and doing something with it. And what we're seeing is, and, and as you heard, I've been in this business for a very long time. Uh, when I first came and started working with ERP, which was, in, I think was the late 80s. I don't know. It's hard to remember back that far. Um, it really was strictly transactional. Right, it was about getting a quote, converting it to an order, running planning, um, having you know suggested purchase orders, and then purchase orders and receipts and invoice, you know receipts and invoices and payments. It was very much about about how do you control the transaction uh, chain that runs a company. Well, that part I think right now you can say is, is kind of a base technology. There's nothing really. Uh, uh, that one company does way, way better than another. And once you have that in place, and every company should with any kind of IT infrastructure, then the question is, hey, now this is not so much about the transaction. It's about insight. What kind of insight uh, can uh, be provided through transactional information and engagement information? So how engaged your customers are and your vendors are. And that leads us to, to what we talked about before, which is this idea of um, 
transform analytics. So descriptive analytics, which is what happened, to predictive analytics is what's going to happen to prescriptive analytics. So using data, using information um, to make recommendations and changes in business operations to actually influence how the business is going to perform. Um, and, and this is, you know, it's it's kind of where we are. There's, you know, everybody talks about predictive analytics and, and uh, especially in terms of maintenance, preventive maintenance. And we're going to talk a little bit more about preventive maintenance and, and predictive maintenance as well. But but this also applies to uh, sales forecasting to be so able to look at customer behavior. It applies to um, to AR um, uh, accounts receivable, and you can look at customer actual customer payment behavior, and it, it allows you then to predict what what that uh, behavior how it's going to affect cash flow and to make changes so you can actually increase uh, margins and profitability based on the insights that you get. So when we start talking about data-driven manufacturing, um, one of the things that, that people say is, well, why now? You know, why is this all of a sudden um, uh, a bigger thing than it has um, been in the past? Well, one of the things that is that uh, the technology is better. Shop floor automation is is pretty prevalent right now. They have better machines, uh, the capability of the machines, the connectivity of the machines, uh, the IT infrastructure that's um, that's out there. All that stuff is improved. And systems like ERP, again, from being very, very uh, small, closed systems to now systems of transaction engagement and insight, um, open systems, cloud-based systems, and the availability of, of things like uh, AI and analytics as a service. Um, the availability of low-cost sensors. At one point, they were very expensive, and now there's there's lots of sensors that are relatively affordable, depending on the value that it presents, that the ROI. And you can have um, sensors for vibration, for machine calibration, uh, temperature sensors. So if you have a product that requires refrigeration, it, it tracks uh, the the temperature of um, water and water damage. Uh, pulse counters, all kinds of different sensors are available. So once you build the model, once you build the flow, once you understand what your KPRs and what you have to measure, then you, there are, uh, there's a whole spectrum of, uh, of sensors that are available in the manufacturing environment. I think I saw recently something like a, a list of 80 different kinds of sensors um, that are available. Uh, internet connectivity is also, of course, something that, that is uh, hugely important. Um, and, and it's not just you know, the, the, what's in the office, but plant shop floor connectivity, whether it's wired or wireless, makes a big difference. Um, whether you can get connectivity outside of your four walls. So um, devices that are tracking shipments, containers, ships, so you have better prediction of when um, items are gonna arrive, when conditions are gonna arrive in, you start doing better planning. Uh, advanced planning scheduling, um, again, that's a part of kind of what bridges the, the manufacturing execution system, the MES system, and the ERP system. Some ERP systems, again, there are many of them. Epicor being a sponsor is one of those where advanced planning scheduling is something they do very well, where it's it's not just finite capacity planning, but it's infinite capacity planning. And it allows you to take um, different dependencies, machines, capacities, peoples, tools, uh, and plan them to optimize output. Um, and, you know, part of the IoT thing is also the ability to take all that information, combine it, and, and start looking how that affects business. We worked with a client who had um, sensors embedded in their vending machine. So instead of, uh, you know, if you had a soda machine in the old days, a guy would show up with a big truck and open the big garage doors, and there were thousands of sodas in there, and he would open the machine and see what needed to be done. Well, one example of, of IoT is we worked with a client who embedded in their vending machines um, uh, sensors that would let them know which products on what days were being sold. So when the guy shows up, uh, he has exactly, you know, he gets a replenishment order for exactly what needs to happen. Now, what that does is it, it impacts your, your planning, it impacts your scheduling, it impact, impacts your obsolete inventory because the sodas aren't going to go bad, um, and it, it kind of disrupts the entire supply chain just by being able to, to collect data uh, at the point in transaction and push that all the way through planning. Um, and as you start looking at this stuff, low-cost sensors, connectivity, IoT, um, there's this explosion in the volume and kinds of data that's out there. So the idea of using technology 
um, to manage big data, to use the analytics, to look at uh, trends uh, in the data that maybe because there's so much of it you couldn't recognize by looking at a spreadsheet. Um, those kind of things let us lead us to the last point here, which is AI and machine learning. And, and AI and machine learning, um, these aren't things you have to develop. These are things that you can buy or you can rent. You can lease an AI model to, to, to help you determine the optimal sales price for all your items. So, but you have to have good data to start with. So, so all these factors together playing now, and they'll continue to accelerate, has made DD um, uh, data-driven manufacturing, I think, more prevalent. Um, and it started out by looking how you can take one resource, like a machine, like a tool, like an employee, um, and through scheduling, how you can optimize them. And most good manufacturing, companies with good manufacturing practices has kind of already maxed that out through the use of ERP. And it's very much time driven, right? So it, it's kind of like I have an order, I have a delivery date, everything's backward planned from that from that particular um, time, that, that particular uh, delivery date. When you start looking at expanding it now, you say, okay, we've got we can optimize the machine. How can I now optimize a, a line, a production line of multiple machines that was more end to end? Um, and now we start talking about advanced planning, finite capacity, but it's driven by time, it's driven by um, capacity. Um, and now we also begin to have the ability to do event-triggered manufacturing, where you could say, hey, when something, a, a receipt comes in, there's a machine is down, an employee is out, now that particular event will, will actually reschedule uh, the operations and the execution on the floor. And eventually you can get to a point where uh, you're you're not you're moving from optimizing a machine to optimizing a line to optimizing the plant to take all your your lines together and start moving operations executions deliverables from line to line so the factory as a whole is being optimizing and you don't have one line that's that's down or being uh, underutilized and another another line being overutilized and eventually the idea would be and and this you know we're beginning to see this but i think this is a little again a little bit of a stretch for the clients we've worked with is they want to look at supply chain um automation to, to say hey we have multiple plants let's figure out how we are going to optimize the scheduling and execution across multiple plants and our vendors um and so at the end of the day that becomes the the goal the vision of a kind of self uh regulating supply chains Take a breath. So what's our, our client number one doing to get to where they need to be? Well, first is um, they decided they needed to create compatible systems that flow into a corporate data structure. So that meant um, spending some time in, in data design, standardization, being able to take unstructured data and give it structure to aggregate it, to visualize it. Um, and look at what kind of uh, standard in terms of systems. Now, some of the some of the things you can do is standardize on a single ERP system. Some of the things you can do is is uh, is set up data standards and use some kind of information consolidation tool, and you know a BI platform or an analytics platform. Um, uh, then they decided that hey, they have a, they have a, a lot of machines uh, across multiple um, environments. Um, and they really needed to, to, to start collecting data at, uh, at the shop for point of uh, activity. So they purchased and deployed an MES system. Um, and, the MES, and the MES was about you know, c connecting their uh, resources together, collecting data from those particular resources, looking at scheduling and control, because MES, as well as ERP, has a, um, a capability of scheduling and controlling, um, some of them with, with really good finite capacity planning. And also, not just having that kind of one-way information flow from the floor up, but also to push instructions, uh, schedule changes, uh, maintenance quality information back down to the floor. Um, so they, they did an analysis of their current data, to aggregate organized the structure. So one of the things that, that I think most people fail to recognize is how much value is in their current data. And that's the first thing we do when we go and we work with clients is we ask them to sit with us and examine what their current data is. If there are issues around production, let's see what kind of production data you've collected over the last three, five, seven years um, and see if they've done anything with it. If, if their issue is about um, uh, of maintenance, we, we, we go down and see you know, what kind of data you have about uh, machine downtime, repairs, that kind of stuff. Um, so we, we look at the current data, 
Um, and we try to, to organize it and understand what we can be able to, what kind of decision improvements we get from current data. And then we start saying, hey, let's take this investment you're going to make in terms of MES platforms, newer machines, uh, uh, new sensors, um, see what we can do to bring legacy equipment online, and now start saying, okay, go moving forward from this day moving forward, how can we start collecting data, data that makes sense, that can be aggregated, that can be visualized, so we can make good decisions. Um, and part of what they did is they replaced their legacy RP with a, a new cloud-based system with the robust APS and BI. So the APS component didn't really sit on the MES system, it sat in the ERP system. And there's different ways of doing that. There's pluses and minuses to both. But at the end of the day, what you really need to do is, is have a tool um, to do finite capacity planning, to look at dependencies between machines, be between tools, between resources, to build simulations, to build priorities, so you can start figuring out what's the best way to run the floor. So what did they get out of it? Well, the one thing is from their historical um, data and their sales data, one thing I recognize is, hey, we're producing products at one plant that are really being sold from a different geographic location. So they started aligning the products with the product line, saying, you know, there's, there was, and frankly, I'm not sure they, they recognize that the customer, beha customer be uh, behavior changed based on the geography because they were just, you know, somebody had an order, they'd fill it, they send it in the truck to, the, to whoever needed it. So now they start saying, let's start aligning our products and our product mixes with uh, customer behavior. Um, so that sales data allowed them to, to do that alignment, um, which reduced obsolete inventory, um, which uh, reduced transportation costs, reduced um, fill time. Um, they also look at how they could optimize the plant, the plant production um, lines to, in, to increase uh, uptime. So they had a very distinct uh, issue where certain lines on the floor, for some reason, were over-scheduled um, and other machines were underscheduled. And what they hadn't done up to that point is set up alternative uh, capacity and alternative routings um, to look at you know, what could be moved from line to line. So, so looking at the information, looking at the data, looking at the systems capability, they started op optimizing plant production. And they started getting better use of the employees. You know, the, the idea for them or one of the issues of um, employee retention it was because it was a very stressful environment for them. Um, so when they looked at their employees and they looked at how they wanted to allocate their time and how they schedule schedule them before or what machines they were going to put them on, they found that they didn't need as much overtime. Um, it's a little early to say exactly if their employee retention is going to go up, um, but certainly it seems like the uh, cultural environment on the shop floor is better than it was when they were firefighting and blaming each other for late, uh, late deliveries. Our second client, well, the first thing they did is they said, okay, we can't have a separate finance organization and a separate production organization. We can't have a separate finance system and a separate logistics and production system. So we have to align the organization around end-to-end -end processes. Um, and then we have to have a technology deployment um, that also focuses on that end-to-end. -end. So from, from uh, demand creation, sales, marketing, CRM, through fulfillment, so purchasing, production, inventory, to to um, to demand support, finance, HR, and stuff. They needed to have you know a single system, a single end-to-end -end technology that that focused on enabling the end-to-end -end process flow. And they did that by the purchase, <coughs> excuse me, of a cloud ACRP system. Um, then and. Also saying, hey, we're not going to use one set of uh, reporting tools for finance and one set of reporting tools for production and one for inventory. Instead, they have a single data analytics platform. So it's a single tra um, uh, transparency for all users. Um, they, they put in a quality based, uh, a cloud based quality management system. So again, part of what they wanted to, to get away from is always worrying about did this thing get inspected? We have to go in and look at the products in the, the finished goods warehouse to see, have they been inspected? Did they pass inspection? So instead of uh, kind of looking at work in progress, um, they started spending more time and money, frankly, on monitoring the condition and the calibration on the machines. And the byproduct of that is their uh, 
their inspection time um, went down and their ability to, to get items out. And again, one of the big things these guys wanted to work on um, and spend some time working on was enterprise reporting. They have dashboards. You know, it's it's amazing how many times the, the uh, CEO would say, hey, I, you know, all I want from you guys is I have a mobile phone. I want to open up my mobile phone anytime and see a graphic that shows me how we're performing. Um, so if he's on the golf course or on the shop or whatever, it's just that kind of dashboard he needed to see. We see more and more in terms of the better systems being able to uh, deploy flexible ad hoc reporting. So any end user can create and save reports and dashboards based on what they want to see without having to go through um, an IT department. Multi-dimensional reporting that, that allows you to kind of um, slice and dice the data based on pretty much any way you want, based on individual users and use cases, um, you know, performance reporting, financial reports, all that stuff had to be in a single uh uh, platform, BI platform, analytics platform. So that was a big step forward for them because the first time in a company, everybody started looking at the same data and talking the same language. So that, that was a, a huge part of what they did. Um, and from moving, you know, the silo reporting to corporate reporting to uh, having KPI-aided de decision-making, moving from run to failure to reliability-based uh, maintenance. That's one of the advantages of trying to have calibration of your machines and, and, um, and automation there. Um, they're able to have significant reduction in downtime, uh, uh, significant um, reduction in reject. So, you know, the, the um, end products uh, had a higher quality pass rate way less time in inspection because it wasn't those people out there doing tests on the finished goods. It was actually more in process. Um, and because of that, they're able to increase their margin. So what are the lessons learned? Um, you know, we've done this a number of times that we want to use a couple clients as examples, but the first thing is you have to establish a data-driven mindset. And this is, this is a, a cultural change from, hey, you know, I, 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 the, you know, a lot of decision-making is the squeakiest wheel gets the most attention. The client who screams the loudest is how we're going to change the production schedule. Or the sales guy who's, you know, who's um, concerned about a particular customer, a particular order. Um, it's really about making decisions based on information, based on data. Um, and then to be able to take uh, uh, goals and actions um, and establish objectives. What do you want to do? Do you is it a reduction in cycle time? Is there a reduction in uh, in downtime? Whatever those goals and objectives are, set those, document, determine how you're going to measure if you can make those. So determining the right KPIs. And you know we have both situations where we go in and we sit with people and we say, you know, show us the reports that you use. And they hand us big stacks of reports and we ask them how many of these do you actually look at? And the answer is not a lot. Um, and instead, what they're looking for is information that they don't have in a report. So what ends up happening is they spend a lot of time on the phone. The sales guy is talking to the production guy. The production guy is talking to the maintenance guy. They go in back and forth on the phone uh, many times. It becomes part of the job, frankly. So, you know, understand um, what you can do, understand what you can deploy, how you can turn data into information. Um, and then, you know, the allow the analytics to help you make good decisions. Now, at some point, I'm sure in the future, the analytics will make the decisions for you, or at least that's the theory. At this point, I still think, you know, analytics are an aid to human decision-making. It's really not at the point now um, where, you know, you just let the machine take over, but, you know, we'll have to see how AI progresses. So that's kind of that. Now, let me just take just a couple of minutes um, to tell you about who we are and what we do, um, and then we'll we'll open this thing up um, to questions. So we're an independent enterprise transformation consulting company. We um, we work from strategy guidance and information um, through uh, process design, data and reporting uh, design, um, uh, organizational change management, uh, technology advising uh, and deployment. Um, and we take everything from the initial conception, starting very high level in terms of, you know, uh, establishing uh, business goals and objectives through information strategy, through the KPIs, the processes, <coughs> through implementation and oversight. And, and a lot of this is also helping the client implement the changes. 
Um, we do not sell any software. We do not receive incentives or recommend software solutions. We don't staff technical resources. We stay independent and we stay um, uh, agnostic. Um, and what it kind of looks like is, you know, the very the beginning is we, we do a readiness assessment. The readiness assessment really says, are you guys really in a position to even start um, a DDM project? I mean, do you, do you have buy-in? Do you have alignment and expectations? Do you have resources to make this thing work? Um, once that readiness assessment is completed, then we start saying, okay, let's get into the idea of strategy and alignment, to talk with the executives, to determine if you have an information strategy, and if you do, it has um, been documented and communicated, and if not, you know we help determine what that information strategy should look like. We need to take a look at the current technology state, including the current state of your data, um, implement best practices, um, start mapping where your data is, where your connectivity is, where your data architecture is, put all that stuff together, determine the correct APIs and analytics, Build a future vision and look at your technology infrastructure and do what we call the three R's. Do you, you know, have technology that you retain because it's fine? It just has to be implemented better. Does it have to be repurposed? Does it have to be updated and added to, um, you know, and, and modified in some way? Or do you really need to think about replacing the infrastructure, the technology, the systems you have in place for something that's new? And it's typically a hybrid solution where some of it will have to be. Um, um, some of it will have to be uh, stuff you retain, some of it will have to be updated or repurposed, and some of it will have to be uh, uh, replaced. Um, and then we go through and help you decide what that technology looks like. We, we go through, we work with vendors like Epicor. Um, we kind of go through the, the idea of understanding what it is you need the, the vendor to provide. That's the, the RFP to how they do it, which is in the, the demonstrations, through building a, a plan, through building recommendations and negotiating, and then into the, the implementation, so the oversight, project management, process government, data governance, um, and a continuous optimization. Um, so what do we do in this particular process when we talk about uh, DDM? Well, um, First, as I mentioned before, we try to assist clients in recognizing that the data they have um, is already extremely valuable. They have years of data, sales data, uh, production data, uh, purchasing data. They have data about, um, about post-sale service. They have data about, um, about operational maintenance. They have lots of stuff that they're not really understanding what they can do with it. So we kind of look at that data first and say, let's tie what you have to your corporate objectives, and let's see if we can structure that data and aggregate it and start building insight from what you already have. Um, so that's that whole idea of, of helping them uh, develop uh, the right KPIs from the data, tie those KPIs to the business goals, um, organize, structure, and interpret the data. And then you know we kind of get to the point where based on what you want, based on the KPIs, based on the data, let's start looking at how we're gonna um, help you in terms of automation, process improvements, uh, and technology. You know, and, and there's a whole mix of stuff in there. Um, and then for those clients who, who want somebody to kind of walk them through the process, we implement the changes. Um, and we look at, uh, we look at the, um, the human element, the, what we call organizational change management as an important piece, because this is a significant change uh, paradigm shift sometimes in how people make decisions about how they run companies. Um, you know, and especially that idea of moving from descriptive, retrospective uh, information to predictive. You know, the whole idea of, yes, trust the data uh, to, to tell you what's going to happen, right? I, I know a lot of people will say, hey, look, I talked to my sales manager. He tells me what sales are going to be. And, and we, we believe in that because human insight is very important. But there's a lot of insight that's available from the data. So you can see trends in anal uh, through the analysis, and sometimes the trends are too small or there's too much data for human to recognize. Um, so uh, that's what we do. Um, we've worked with, uh, up to this point, we've like had six to 700 engagements in all industries, manufacturing, discrete process, biosciences, uh, financials, um, you know, pretty much medical devices, everything. Um, and like I said, we've worked with with many, many different ERP systems. We keep a knowledge base of all the systems. We have a group that, that does our research, that publishes our research, 
and keeps that um, that knowledge base up to date of of all the different systems. So when we understand your requirements, we understand your KPI, your your analytical requirements. We can match you to a solution or a best of breed combination of solutions to be able to realize business benefit. Uh, and that's what we got, um, Jill. Okay, thank you, Alan. That was a great presentation. Uh, we have had a few questions come in, so we are going to jump right into those. Um, I would like to give Alan just a chance to take a breather, however. So, <laughs> so I am going to first uh, tell our audience members or ask our audience members as a reminder, please take a moment um, to complete the feedback form that will appear on the screen at the end of the webinar. Please don't forget to do that. And uh, if you haven't submitted a question and you still have one, please do that now. And with that, Alan, I am going to jump to our first question, which is, what is the biggest challenge to moving to a data-driven environment? Um, so I, I think I think there's there's two. I know they're asking the biggest, but the, I think the single biggest one is siloed data sources and um, legacy systems. That that you know many of the systems were designed not to talk to each other, or, or they weren't designed to talk to one another. A, a lot of the stuff that was purchased. Um, was really about solving a point solution or point problem with a point solution. And now we're, we really need to start thinking about um, how do you aggregate data again across disparate systems? Um, how do you give meaning to that data? Um, so the, the first, I think the, the biggest challenge right now is to be able to look at the data you have, understand how you collect it, how you can aggregate it, how you can give it meaning. Okay, thank you. Um, I am going to jump to this next question that says, can you go back to the ROI slide and describe the ROI of the customer again? I can. Let's see if I can. Oh, let's go to, I think it was this one. Nope. Uh, I'm trying to click on the right slide. There it is. Is that the one? I hope that's the one. So now what you're looking at is um, the ROI that these people got. Um, uh, and there were two different clients, but this is the first client where th they really looked at it. And I'll, I'll go through both of these slides real quick. So the first client, um, it was really about because they, they could align um, production with customer demand, um, they did a way better job of reducing obsolete inventory because they weren't they weren't producing stuff that was going to sit in inventory for a very long time where there was no demand. Um, and they also, uh, because they were building a smaller variety of products um, in, a, in each plant, they're able to, um, to uh, increase, uh, reduce the, 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 how much fill time it took. So it took shorter time to be able to get to all this stuff. So less scrap, less rework, less in, um, obsolete inventory, and the, they're able to fill their, uh, their orders in 30% less time. And again, the idea of reduction of overtime because there were better utilization of people and the better utilization of, uh, of resources. The next one, let me see if I can find it here, was this one. Was this one? No? Hang on a second. I'm trying to find the right slide. This one. Okay, so this is the, the one who really, um, and I think, you know, when we started looking at uh, end to end. So this is really about one single um, solution, um, and and I think the first client had a better use of big data um, in analytics and AI than these guys did. But you know when you talked about how you can use uh, AI and machine learning in action, that we, and which I think is part of the question, you know you have a lot of data. Um, and, and in the instance, I'm going to go back to the first client. They had tons of data. They had years and years and years of data because it was a relatively mature company. And then lots and lots of sales data. Um, and every year, they were trying to figure out what the optimal selling price was for their product so they could, so they could you know, reach optimal margin without losing sales. So 
they had quote data, they had sales data, they had margin data, and there was just tons and tons of it. So they would, um, what they did was actually they rented an AI model to push all this data in. Here's you know 10 years of quotes and 10 years of sales and 10 years of costs. Um, and for each of the products, it would develop um, uh, an optimal selling price. Um, and when you start talking about machine learning is now letting the, as more and more data increases, the analytics get smarter on their own to be able to give you better interpretation of the information um, uh, to make better decisions. All right, Jill, next question. Okay, we have two questions that are sort of similar, so I'm going to try to wrap them up into one big question. Okay. So the question is, or the questions are, um, how do you start and what are the first steps? And then the, uh, the related question is, is uh, one of the questioners uh, specifically wants those answers for a small company versus a large, and in fact, questions whether this technology is only useful for large businesses. Um, so let, let's start about where do you start? Well, I think where you start, you know, most small companies, we'll talk about this, um, most small companies start out by saying, hey, we have a product, we, we need to produce it, and we, we need sales. And, it, you know, sales... Uh, Growth company, growth focused companies is how you go from small to large, um, and so you know you also have to understand what it is that you can manage. So if you're a small company in the production environment and you say, "Look, we're, we're really interested in doing a better job of getting to data driven. Where do I start?" Well, one of the places you will start is with sales data, with customer data, to take that data and to do things like uh, price optimization, predictive sales information to to do. Um, analytics-driven forecasting, sales forecasting, because you need to drive revenue before you can invest more money down on the production floor. I think that's a realistic. So I would start with with looking at things like um, price optimization, sales for you know insight-based sales forecasting. Um, once you get to that point, then you start looking at the second piece, which is uh, how can I enable the shop floor? Now, for a small company, you know you probably is way more manageable to look across your production to understand what's going on. Um, so you may not need to, to buy lots of centers. You may not need to even um, have, you know, large analytics. It probably always makes sense to have good planning and scheduling software. So even if you have five or six machines to be able to see how you optimize your machines and optimize your resources, um, you know, and, and I would say, and I don't know a lot about the company, but, you know, if, if an issue is capacity, then finite capacity planning through APS is something that you're going to get um, you're going to get pretty significant benefit from, benefit from without huge investment of time, or I should say huge investment of dollars. So, um, but again, it it depends on what your initial problems are, um, and it depends on you know, your capacity for change. In terms of where you start, whether you're a small company or a big company, um, I think you have to start with uh, with kind of um, developing that that culture that says we're we're going to make decisions based on information, um, you know, and, and whatever it is before anybody makes a decision, whether you know whether it's you're going to go see a movie or you're going to try to decide what phone to buy, data is the first thing you want to collect. So you have to understand what's the most important important information for me to make a decision, and how can I get that information, and what that information tell me. So that idea of we're not going to chase every issue. We're not going to chase every sale. We're going to start by saying, um, you know, what is the KPIs that will drive my company and how am I going to collect that information and what is this information? So it's that, that first thing is about um, building a mindset and you need to have uh, corporate ownership of the effort because it's, it's not going to happen overnight. So you, know, you have to be persistent. Um, you have to be um, constant in moving to a new environment where, you know, you are going to look at data. And, you know, when you start looking at data collection, it, that's a hard thing to get. That's why automation is so important. It's a hard thing to get people to enter data into a system. And I don't know anybody who, who bought a CRM system, as an example, and said, oh, I love my sales guys because they always put data in. They don't. They don't like doing that stuff. So the, so the uh, advantages of trying to automate what you can and, you know, things like workflow 
as a component of a, a system like Epicor is really great because it, it kind of enforces that whole idea of, um, of structure and process and, uh, and data collection, uh, you know, kind of automates that through workflow. So, sorry, Jill, I have a tendency to go on. No, no, no. I think the more robust the answer, the better our audience likes it, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, we probably have time for just a couple more questions. And I'm going to move into how long does it take to move to data-driven manufacturing? Um, it takes time. So, I mean, the customers we've been working with have been doing this for uh, two to three years. Um, and, and yeah, it, 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 is, it is a process. It is a process um, that you have to be committed to. So, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody should have an expectation that they're going to start the process and be done in six minutes. Okay. So it kind of differs for everybody as well? It depends on how, how big your challenges are. But, you know, I, I think it, it takes, you know, it takes for a small company, probably takes a year for a mid-sized company, a couple of years, because there's way more data to manage and organize. Okay. And I love this next question. Who should own the process? Not the IT guy. So um, the IT group, they're the enablers, right? So it's the, the, um, a business owner, a CEO, a CFO, a chief operational officer, depending on what their, the particular pain points, need to own the process. They need to develop the vision to be able to understand what the right KPIs are, to understand what they're trying to manage. And then they work with the, T, the IT guys. They're the enablers to make that happen. But, you know, I think it's always a mistake to think this is an IT project, even though it has a lot of technology components. It's a business project. It's a business project. Yep. So would there be like a single owner or like a team ownership or what, should operations well, be involved? Well, it depends on what, what, your, what your, the issues are that you're trying to solve. You should always have a single corporate owner, and then you have a, like a steering committee to help them make decisions. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you need a person to drive it. Because if you start putting several people as sponsors, and there was an old joke, you know, do you know what a camel is? A camel is a horse designed by committee. So I always believe that you have a single owner who drives the process, who, who you know, makes decisions, that there's a steering committee behind them um, that helps them through the decision-making process. Um, and make sure, you know, that, that the, those decisions are validated. Okay. I never heard the camel saying before. I'm an old guy. <laughs> okay. With that, we need to wrap up the presentation. So I would like again to say, Alan, thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you as well. Um, for going through these questions and helping our audience uh, understand better data-driven manufacturing. So I'd like to thank, obviously, Alan, as I said, and I would like to thank our sponsor, Epicor. And of course, most of all, I'd like to thank you, our audience members, for your kind attention as well as your great questions. And finally, on behalf of Industry Week, I'd like to say thanks and have a great, productive remainder of your day. Thank you.